and I bought myself this microphone right here. And over the course of a one academic break uh, around Christmas, a holiday break, I recorded seven episodes. I just came up with seven ideas, seven topics, recorded them, put it out there into the wild and shared this new podcast with everyone on my contact list. I swear every single person in my email contact list got a custom email from me saying, hey, I've got a new show, please share it, uh, hope you like it. And the show took off. That was seven years ago. And as the years have gone by, uh, the podcast grew. The, that led to more opportunities, the, the, the opportunity to start hosting shows, to doing interviews with the news media, to start writing books. And then the more I did it, the more fun I was having. And now, instead of just being a small slice of my life, uh, outreach and communication are one of the biggest or the biggest part of my professional career. And I maintain the affiliations with Stony Brook University and the Flatiron Institute so that I can still stay connected to all my friends and colleagues in astrophysics. Uh, but I'm just having a really good time doing outreach. That's awesome. Well, I'm, I'm glad you're doing it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the uh, I, I did kind of want to follow up on that and, and ask about um, going back a little bit prior to the outreach part, how, how you got into astrophysics, like what was mm. that spoke to you about it that that just got you thinking, okay, this, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to study. Yeah, my, my path to astrophysics and science itself was definitely not linear. I, I grew up as a kid reading all sorts of science books, all sorts of fish, fiction books. I would just devour any book that my parents would get me. I just absolutely loved reading. But I had always assumed when I read science books that that science was done by other people. It wasn't something that someone like I could do. That wasn't smart enough. I wasn't capable enough. I didn't have the right background. And I actually went into college as a computer science major, something much, much more practical in real world, in my mind, than science. And in my third year of college, I took an astronomy elective because I had always liked astronomy. I needed an elective. I thought it'd be great. And within a couple of weeks, my professor said, look, you know, I got to chatting with the professor, making friends with him. He said, look, if you're interested in physics or astronomy as a career, you can do it. Just all you have to do is switch majors to physics and you're done. And it took me less than a week to switch majors, completely change the direction of my career. And when I was in college, switching to physics, I didn't have a plan. I didn't know that I would end up as a professor. I didn't know that I would end up with a PhD. But as I kept going, I found physics and astronomy really challenging, really rewarding, uh, really enriching for me. I was just having a lot of fun. And going on into a doctorate program at the University of Illinois. And even when I got to Illinois, I didn't know if astrophysics was for me. I was interested in high energy physics. I was interested in chaos theory. I was interested in astrophysics and cosmology. And I met my advisor, Dr. Paul Ricker, who uh, just was working on some really, really cool projects. And then that's what, what settled it for me. And so I haven't looked back ever since. Um, um, and there was mention on your website that you've, you've also done these cool collaborations um, with Arts and Humanities, right? Like I think you did a, a dance project. Um, That's right. I, I absolutely love collaborating with artists because I'm extremely passionate about communicating science. And there's a certain audience that will buy my books or, or watch my TV shows or just, just show up. There is also a large audience that isn't interested in science. That, that doesn't think that a show about science will resonate with them or connect with them. And so years ago, I started partnering with artists to, to just try to explore this intersection and try to uh, reach new audiences and bring science to them and explore these new creative avenues. And uh, my previous position, I was at the Ohio State University. And I was actually a member of something called the STEAM Factory, which stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Art, 
arts and mathematics. And this is a network of faculty at the Ohio State University that I was a part of, of trying to do cross-disciplinary research and outreach. And so while I was at the Ohio State University, I partnered with a dance company there, Seven dance company. And I created, I produced, uh, wrote and narrated a dance performance called Song of the Stars, where we explored the life histories of the stars in our universe uh, through narration and dance. And we had a Kickstarter campaign to pay for it. We, it was very successful. We were able to film it. We were able to broadcast it on PBS member stations nationwide. Uh, since then, uh, and after moving to New York City, I now am currently working with Siren Modern Dance here in New York. And we've created a project called TikTok, where we explore the nature of time, again, through my narration and through movement and uh, the amazing music of Bach. And so that's a performance. It, it was on tour until uh the COVID-19 pandemic hit, uh, but I'm sure it will go on tour again. Uh, besides dance companies, I've also worked with poets and visual artists. I'm also working with a composer and director right now to create an opera about black holes. And so that project should be coming around next year. Very cool. That, that's something that speaks to me very personally as, as somebody with a background in the humanities who just happened to be geek. I find those kinds of things very, very cool. Um, I did want to, to ask just a little bit about, um, well, naturally about space itself, because there have been mm -hmm. cool things that, um, and, and cool discoveries that have been happening uh, very recently in the past few years, such as the you know, our first photo of a, a black hole and mm -hmm. you know, LIGO and Venus last week. So, so many cool things. Um, are, is, there, is there anything uh, about the current moment in astrophysics that you find particularly exciting or, or hopeful about or that you're like, yes, I'm, I'm glad this is, we're finally uh, making some headway on this area? Yeah, as the uh, the news with Venus, uh, when that hit last week, that just showed how much interest and excitement there is around uh, the possibility of life outside the Earth. This is something we have always wondered about. This is something we've always been curious about. But now we are on the threshold of actually having the technology to really and seriously detect potentially life outside the Earth. And we're doing it through several different techniques. We're exploring our own solar system for signs of life on Mars, on Venus, on the frozen moons uh, orbiting the giant planets. And then we're also developing techniques to find planets outside the solar system altogether. And currently we have a catalog of over 6,000 known planets outside the solar system. We call those exoplanets. We have just barely scratched the surface of hunting for exoplanets. We are looking for signs of life. We are looking for copies of Earth. We haven't found it yet, but we are on the trajectory to have the technology to make that detection. Uh, you know, we suspect there are around one trillion planets in the galaxy. If 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 one of them has life, uh, we're, we'll find it eventually. And so I think personally, that's very, very exciting to me is this hunt for life. That has been a major question ever since we've been able to ask questions. It's been a major philosophical question, a major scientific question. But now we're we have the technology, we have the techniques, we have the science, we know what we're looking for. And over the coming years and decades, we're doing it. We're doing the surveys, we're, we're doing the studies, we're, we're trying to find life. And if there's anything out there, intelligent or otherwise, it doesn't matter, just the possibility of life outside the earth is incredibly exciting to me. Yeah, and and I, I, I think that's, very, very exciting, just as you mentioned. And, and also, um, I wanted to ask about um, cosmic voids, because I think that was something that was mentioned as, as part of a, a big research area of yours. Um, so maybe you could explain to folks, like, what is a cosmic void and, um, and, and why is it important to our understanding of the universe? Right. So one of the big areas of my research is Absolutely nothing. Like, you know that joke that a, a specialist is someone who knows more and more about less and less? Well, I took that to the absolute extreme and I became an expert on nothing. But not just any nothing. This is, this is a real big nothing. Uh, what I am studying 
My particular field within astrophysics is something called cosmology. This is the study of the universe itself. We are trying to understand its history, its origins, its, its makeup, its, its future uh, trajectory, everything about the universe. And so when we study cosmology, when we study the universe, we have to zoom out to the very, very largest scales. So we have to zoom out of our solar system. We have to zoom out of our stellar neighborhood. We have to zoom outside of the Milky Way galaxy. We have to zoom outside of our local group of galaxies. We have to zoom all the way out, take that grand, grand perspective to such a degree that entire galaxies are just individual points of light. I mean, an individual galaxy is home to hundreds of billions of stars. And we're, when we do cosmology, we look at such vast scales that those vast structures, you know, 100,000 light years across, home to hundreds of billions of stars, are just tiny points of light. And when we zoom out like this, we reveal something about the universe, something surprising, something we didn't know until the 70s and 80s when we first started making these kinds of big surveys. And that is that galaxies in our universe are not scattered around randomly. There is a pattern, there's a structure to how galaxies are arranged. We call this the large scale structure of the universe. It's also known as the cosmic web because when you zoom out, what you see are like long filaments made of galaxies. And you see dense knots of, uh, called clusters of over a thousand galaxies. And we see broad, vast walls of galaxies. So it looks like a giant cobweb, except it's billions of light, hundreds of billions of light years across. And by studying that structure, which is the largest pattern found in nature, by studying that, we can gain insights into the history and evolution and future of our universe. And most surveys uh, prior to say a decade ago, focused on the galaxies, focused on mapping where the galaxies are, ma mapping the, the length of the filaments and the size of the clusters. Uh, but starting a few years ago, myself and a few colleagues around the world started investigating more deeply the places where the galaxies aren't. The big empty spaces in the universe, we call these the cosmic voids. And the cosmic voids dominate the universe by volume. The vast majority of our universe is just these barren deserts home to almost nothing at all. And we developed techniques to find cosmic voids, to characterize them, to study them, and to link them to essential properties about the universe, like the history of the expansion of the universe, uh, the components of the universe, the mysterious substances of dark matter and dark energy. Uh, we're using cosmic voids as laboratories to study some of these hidden components of our universe. And so voids over the past few years have come out to be an incredibly powerful tool to, to study the universe, to understand the universe. And, you know, it turns out by looking at nothing, you can really learn something. Very cool. Um, so I, I want to invite everyone who's here, if you have a question for Paul, please um, feel free to put it in chat. and I will monitor that. Um, and so we can get some, some questions for him. Um, and while you're thinking about some questions, um, I... I wanted to, I, I guess, bring up a bit of a bit of controversy, um, and and that is Pluto. Where do we stand on Pluto, and why? Right. So the current definition of Pluto, as of two thousand six, so about fourteen years going strong now, is that Pluto is not considered a planet. It is considered a dwarf planet. Now, this definition was adopted in 2006, because prior to that, there was no strict definition of the word planet. We were calling everything we felt like a planet, and this kind of worked uh, when we just had nine planets. We knew that Pluto was a little bit weird as this really janky angle in its orbit, and sometimes it's closer to the sun than Neptune is, and sometimes it's further. We knew something funny was up with Pluto, but we weren't exactly sure what. But starting in the late 1990s, we started discovering 
other objects out there in the same orbit as Pluto or a little bit further away than Pluto. And it quickly became apparent that if Pluto is a planet, then we're going to have 10,000 planets. And that seemed like a lot for people to memorize. So people started, astronomers started agitating to come up with some sort of strict definition. Now, some astronomers do believe that Pluto should be a planet and we should just have 10,000 planets in the solar system. And who cares? You just memorize like the 10 biggest and move on with your life. While others think that we're misunderstanding something fundamental about the nature of planets if we insist that there are 10,000 planets in the solar system. The debate still continues today, but there has not been a new vote on this since 2006. And in 2006, they adopted a three-part definition for what makes a planet a planet. Uh, part one is that it has to orbit the sun. Okay, fair. Part two is that it has to be big enough and have enough gravity to make itself round. This excludes the comets, uh, almost all the asteroids, all the junk in the solar system that definitely is not a planet. But according to those two things, Pluto is still a planet because it orbits the sun and it's big enough to be round. So they deliberately added a third part to the definition, a th third criterion, that was explicitly designed to rule Plu Pluto out as planet status. And that third rule was that in order to be a planet, you have to clear your orbit of any remaining debris. So if we look at like Jupiter, there's Jupiter and then there's basically nothing else in its orbit. If we look at Earth, there's Earth and there's basically nothing else in Earth's orbit. But if we look at Pluto, there's also a lot of junk out there in the orbit of Pluto. So that's why it fails the definition. That's why it got demoted to the status of dwarf planet. Uh, in exchange, the asteroid series, the largest asteroid in the asteroid belt, got promoted from asteroid to dwarf planet. So we have at least two dwarf planets in the solar system. We have a bunch more out there past the orbit of Neptune. Again, not every astronomer or planetary scientist agrees with this definition. It is still a matter of controversy. It is still a matter of discussion because we are still learning about the outer solar system. Uh, but that is the definition as it stands today. So that's what all our kids are learning. And thank you. So we, we have a question here. And the question is, the expansion of the universe is accelerating. Can this be explained by a change in the, sl uh, in the slope of the gravity well that the universe has been climbing out of since the Big Bang? All right, so, so good question, Scott. So uh, the universe is expanding. We found this out about 100 years ago. But about 20 years ago, astronomers discovered that not only is the universe expanding, that expansion is accelerating. So every day, the universe is getting bigger and bigger faster and faster. We have a name for this phenomenon. We call it dark energy. We, we absolutely don't understand it. We, we don't know. The bottom line is we don't know what is causing the accelerated expansion of the universe. Uh, Scott, you make mention uh, to like slopes of gravity wells. Uh, the universe has been climbing out of. So the universe itself is not climbing out of some gravity well, like a ball, uh, like rolling down a hill or rolling up a hill or moving around. The universe itself contains everything that there is. Uh, the universe itself is not moving through something. The, the universe itself is not uh, transitioning through something. And so the universe is expanding. This is its natural dynamical state. We realize this through Einstein's theory of general relativity. And as to why it is currently accelerating in, an ex in its expansion, what's providing the energy source, what's changing, we honestly don't know. And we, we have a follow-up question of, uh, that says a recent Nobel winner said we would never visit another solar system because we do not have the physics to get anywhere quickly. Do you agree with this? Uh, actually, I do. You know, our universe, the universal speed limit is the speed of light. Uh, going at the speed of light, it would take about four years to reach our next nearest star. 
but accelerating to the speed of light or somewhere close to the speed of light requires so much energy that it is simply not feasible. It's not impossible. There are big energy sources out there. There, there, there is energy out there, but the amount of energy that human civilization can wield and store and utilize is so pathetically small that the concept of traveling to another star is so far remote, it's, it's, it's just science fiction. It's just going to stay science fiction for centuries, if not millennia to come. Uh, to give you some examples, our fastest space probes that are now outside the solar system are the Voyager probes. They're traveling at like 36,000 miles per hour, which is really fast. At that speed, if they were name, aimed at our nearest neighbor star, Proxima Centauri, which they aren't, but if they were, it would take them 40,000 years to get there. 40,000 years, and that's the fastest spacecraft we've ever made. To get up there, to get to Alpha Centauri in any appreciable amount of time just requires so much raw energy that we as humans do not have the capability of harnessing that much energy. Will our descendants someday in the future? Sure, it's not impossible, but it is also highly, highly improbable for our current technological level and for any reasonable extensions of our current technological level for the next few decades or centuries. I, I wanted to follow up on, on the question uh, that was uh, where you kind of alluded to, um, to dark energy and, and mm -hmm. of the universe, um, because I, I feel like that's often spoken about in, in the same breath with dark matter. So could you maybe tell us a little bit about that or what it might be? Yeah, yeah. Dark matter and dark energy, these really fascinating topics in cosmology and the study of our universe. Uh, it turns out that the kind of matter that we're used to the kind of matter you're made of, that the earth is made of, that the sun is made of, that every star is made of, that galaxies are made of. We call this kind of matter baryonic matter for various annoying particle physics reasons. It turns out that the kind of matter we're used to, baryonic matter, makes up about 4% of all the energy content in our entire universe. Who knew? Uh, in the 70s, we first started getting our hints of what we now call dark matter which is we believe to be a form of matter that we simply don't understand. It is some new kind of particle that we haven't cataloged yet, that we haven't created yet, that we haven't found yet. We can find the influence of dark matter throughout our universe at all sorts of different scales uh, because when we look at a galaxy and we look at how it behaves, how fast it rotates, how it moves, how it acts, how hot it is, there isn't enough normal matter to account for all that behavior. So there has to be some sort of matter that does not interact with light. So a better name for dark matter is invisible matter, but I'm not in charge of naming things. So invisible matter is the name or dark matter is the name that's stuck. And this accounts for about 20%, 20 to 25% of the energy in our universe. The rest of our universe is something we call dark energy. And it is this accelerating expansion of the universe. Whatever is causing it is responsible for the vast majority of the energy in our universe. We have no idea what it is. So we do have a question from Braden here. It says, being a specialist in great voice in the universe, do you often study, observe the effects of dark matter energy? If so, how does it manifest itself? Absolutely. Using cosmic voids, we can study both the behavior of dark matter and dark energy. And uh, speaking of dark energy first, when we look around like on the earth, we're not going to see the effects of dark energy because dark energy is there but it's always constant. And then the energy density of like my body and the rocks and the trees and the air and the, and the earth's magnetic field are way stronger than any effects of dark energy. So we don't see the effects of dark energy on the earth or in our solar system or inside of galaxies. We can only see the effects of dark energy when we look at the universe 
at large. But when we look inside the voids, whatever is causing the universe to accelerate its expansion is doing it in the voids. Over time, the voids of our universe are getting bigger. And it's this combined inflation of all the voids that is driving a part of the universe. So when we look to the voids, we're actually looking at laboratories of dark energy. This is where dark energy lives inside the voids. So by studying and characterizing the voids, we can get a better handle on the properties of dark energy than we can by looking inside of all the structures. And when it comes to dark matter, it's a similar story. The, the voids of our universe are almost completely empty of normal matter and also almost completely empty of dark matter. But the evolution of, our, of the structure of our universe, the growth and evolution of this cosmic web over the course of billions of years is tied to the properties of dark matter. So if you change what dark matter is, if you have a new hypothesis to explain what dark matter could be, one of the first places you go looking is in how it evolves the cosmic structure over billions of years. We can do this with very fancy and very cool computer simulations. And one of the best places to examine the structure of our universe is through the voids. So if you start changing what dark matter is, if you think, oh, dark matter might be this or this or that, the voids are going to tell you if you're right or not. Great question. And I, I actually, I wanted to ask, um, going up a, a little bit earlier, when there was the question about if we'll ever escape our solar system. And I wanted to ask you specifically, because this is related to an episode I remember hearing once on, on Ask a Spaceman, where you talked about the orbit cloud. And it just, it really, for the almost the first time, it. Uh, I was able to kind of visualize just how enormously huge our solar system is, right? Because when I when I learned it in second grade, it's like they're spaced on an eight and a half. Right, 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 right. Yeah. So maybe could you maybe break that down for us a little bit to give us a sense of scale? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, our solar system, it leaving the solar system depends on what you mean by the boundary of the solar system. And there's a couple potential definitions floating around for you to use. One definition is based on something we call the heliopause. So, so our sun is constantly emitting a stream of tiny little charged particles. As we call it the solar wind, it makes the aurora. It's very cool. It's mostly benign. And it blows out and forms a bubble. And there's a point, a certain distance from the sun, where that solar wind starts to mix with the, the general interstellar medium, when that boundary is called the heliopause. And that's generally considered, like, once you're past that, you're outside the influence of the sun. Like, you can't really taste the sun anymore. You don't really feel like the sun. It really feels like interstellar space. And we have spacecraft out there already. The Voyager and Pioneer probes, or excuse me, just the Voyager probes, are already outside of the heliopause. They are, by this definition, outside the solar system. But past that heliopause, and all the planets are contained within the heliopause, but past the heliopause, there are objects in our uh, objects that are gravitationally bound to the sun. They are weakly, weakly orbiting the sun. We call this region the Oort cloud. It is the origin of comets. Uh, it's, it's this reservoir of tiny little icy bits. It's the leftovers from the formation of the solar system. And every once in a while, they, they can just hang out in orbit for millions of years. And then every once in a while, they can get destabilized and plunge inwards to the inner solar system where they cause havoc. The Oort cloud is huge. It's not, there isn't a lot of mass. There's about five to 30 Earth, Earth masses worth of stuff out there, but it's spread throughout a volume about two light years wide. So the inner boundary of the Oort cloud isn't too far away, but then the outer boundary of the Oort cloud is about a light year away. 
Uh, to give you some sense of scale, the Voyager probes, even though they passed the heliopause and are now in interstellar space, it will take them, if I remember right, it will take them about 300 more years to reach the inner boundary of the Oort cloud, and then about 10,000 years to cross the outer boundary of the Oort cloud. So if you consider the Oort cloud the boundary of our solar system, the Voyager probes are nowhere near it. Uh, but if you consider the, the heliopause the boundary of our solar system, then we're already an interstellar species. Is there, do you, where do you come down on <laughs> Heliopause versus Oort cloud. I think I actually think the heliopause is a very reasonable definition because yeah, the Oort cloud objects are gravitationally bound, but that's that's not a very useful definition because the the Voyager spacecraft are fast enough that they will escape the gravity of our sun, so they are not gravitationally bound to our sun. So you need something else. You need like a physical marker in space rather than gravitational binding. And the heliopause makes sense because when you're inside of it, you mostly feel the influence of the sun in terms of your environment. And then once you're outside of it, you stop feeling the influence of our sun. All right, you, you convinced me. <laughs> um, so we do have a couple of questions here. Let's let's start mm -hmm. with Emily's, uh, who asks, "Do you think dark matter slash energy was responsible for the Big Bang?" So dark matter and dark energy are components of the universe, just the same way that the atoms and particles that make up you are components of the universe. So all these ingredients are simply a part of the universe. They were present in the early universe. Dark matter was already kicking around. Dark energy was already laying around in the background in the early universe. When it comes to the origin of the universe and what kick-started the Big Bang, we do not have an answer for that question. We understand the very earliest moments of the universe. We can actually push our understanding back to less than the first second of the history of our universe. Once you start pushing back there, pushing closer and closer uh, to the Big Bang, we stop understanding because our physics simply isn't sophisticated enough to understand it. We don't know what started the Big Bang. We don't even know if that question makes sense because at those extreme scales, we don't even know if our conceptions of time and space even apply. So we don't know what started the Big Bang. We don't know what created the universe, if you want to use that term. Uh, and we don't even know if that question makes sense. That, that is outside of known science. Awesome. Um, and we have here a question about wormholes. And, and I was very curious if we were going to get a wormhole question today. You mentioned that it would take thousands of years to travel to other systems with current technology. What if we could travel through a wormhole? Do you think wormholes exist? Uh, no, I don't think wormholes exist. I don't think that they are. Every time we try to conceive of a wormhole in physics, uh, they break down immediately. They, they're horrendously unstable. You simply can't build a macroscopic wormhole. That's current, current physics, of course. I think that's correct. I think the universe is trying to tell us something about wormholes. But let's say, let's play that game like, okay, wormholes exist. You can't just make a wormhole and automatically jump to a random part of the universe. You have to build it. You have to take the two ends and place them somewhere in order to get your wormhole to work. So yeah, even if wormholes exist, you still need to do the hard work of carrying one end of the wormhole to where you want to go. Then everyone else who follows you gets the shortcut, uh, but not you. So we have a, here a horrible existential question from Scott. Um, if we can't visit other solar systems uh, slash life forms, are we alone in the universe? I truly don't think, I don't suspect that we are alone in the universe. There are hundreds of billions of stars in the Milky Way galaxy. There are two trillion galaxies in the observable volume of the universe. I really don't think we're alone. But because of the extreme timescales, 
space scales, energy scales needed to cross from one star to another, I do believe that we are effectively alone. We may find evidence for life uh, orbiting on a planet orbiting another star. It will come through indirect evidence, through analysis of the atmosphere or the contents of that planet. I don't think we're ever going to say hello to anyone. I don't think we're ever going to shake hands and meet. I think there are other intelligent civilizations out there in the universe, but I don't think we're ever going to meet them. So even though we are not alone, we're basically alone. Um. And there's also a question about what about extra dimensional space? How many dimensions do you think there are? So currently in physics and through observations, everything we know about the universe and through our experiences, uh, there are four dimensions in the universe. There are three dimensions of space and one dimension of time. Some theoretical versions or some hypothetical uh, theories of physics like quantum supergravity or string theory propose the existence of extra dimensions. These would be very, very tiny curled up dimensions like sub, sub, sub microscopic. Uh, some theories say there are 10, others say there are 11, others are a little bit ambiguous. These theories have been proposed for decades. They haven't really panned out yet. And in fact, there is some experimental evidence disfavoring these ideas. But um, so, so we got to go with the evidence that we do have. And the evidence that we do have says that there are three spatial dimensions and one dimension of time. And that's it. Fantastic. Um, it, and something that I, I kind of want to ask about, just because it's, uh, we did mention uh, wormholes and, and we've mentioned string theory. One thing that we haven't brought up, which is, I feel is always brought up in these kinds of things, is, is black holes. Uh, black holes, yep. yeah. Could you, could you kind of explain for those who may not know, like, what exactly is a black hole and uh, right. how, how do we know they exist? <laughs> Right, a black hole is your worst nightmare. It is a place that you can enter, but you cannot leave. It is a place where gravity is so strong, it has literally punctured a hole in space-time itself and wrapped in itself in something we call an event horizon. An event horizon is a, a mathematical boundary where if you cross the event horizon, you cannot leave. Black holes, we first figured out that they might exist through Einstein's theory of general relativity, but for decades, they were just waved off as some, you know, just some weird thing that popped up in the math, and, but not something that nature would actually cook up. It turns out that when you have a giant star, right before it goes supernova, it suffers complete gravitational catastrophic collapse. And there is enough matter there to trigger this infall, this collapse, where nothing is able to support it, nothing is able to resist it, and it just keeps collapsing and collapsing and collapsing and forming a black hole. Uh, nowadays, we have many, many, many lines of evidence that black holes do exist. We've seen, we can watch material fall into black holes. We can watch stars orbit black holes. We can see when black holes merge together, they create ripples of gravity called gravitational waves that we can detect. And then last year, we got our first image of the disk of material surrounding a black hole. And it is a portrait of a black hole. So yeah, black holes are real things. We do not fully understand them. We know at their centers, something we call the singularity, is a place where all of our physics understanding breaks down. But so far, every observation we've made of black holes uh, confirms what we know through general relativity. Uh, the nearest black hole is over a thousand light years away. Well, I should say the nearest known black hole is over a thousand light years away. So nothing to worry about, not an existential threat. Uh, but you know, if you're trapezing across the galaxy, um, you do not want to meet them. In fact, uh, now that we mentioned black holes, this is a subject of my book, How to Die in Space, uh, where I talk about all the fantastic ways to die in space, including death by black hole. Uh, that book is available at Barnes and Noble. It's available on Amazon. Uh, and also autograph copies are available on my website, uh, pmsouter.com slash book. Awesome. Uh, 
we have a we have a couple of comments here. So Anne mentions Hotel California. I think yep yeah the Event Horizon. And uh, can you explain quantum entanglement to me like I'm in fifth grade? Yeah, so I can't explain quantum entanglement to a fifth grader, and I won't even pretend. I will describe quantum entangle entanglement a little bit, but I'm not going to pretend that a fifth grader can understand it. There are just there are some concepts out there in the real world that aren't meant for fifth graders, uh, but, but the basic, basic gist of quantum entanglement is that you can take two or more particles, very subatomic particles, prepare them in a very special state, and then send them flying across your laboratory, across the universe, and they still maintain some sense of quantum connectedness where they share uh, a common state, a common identity. And we can use this common identity to, to learn things about the universe, to learn things about the other particles. Um, it's not breaking any laws of physics because we understand quantum entanglement literally through the laws of physics. Um, and it's a cool, spooky, weird quantum thing. So if you're ever interested in quantum mechanics, just, rem just realize that the world of the subatomic particles looks absolutely nothing like the macroscopic world. There's a whole different set of rules down there. And this is one of the manifestations of those weird rules. Awesome, fantastic. And I, and I think, um, is that, in some way related to black holes evaporating, is that correct? <sighs> Ye kinda sorta uh, black holes, we learned through the work of Stephen Hawking, uh, don't last forever and they're not completely black. They, they glow just a, just a tiny bit. Um, one way to understand the work of Stephen Hawking in this effect we call Hawking radiation is through entangled particles falling into a black hole or manifesting near a black hole. That's To me, that's more of a diversion. There is some discussion of what happens or some uh, questions about what happens to entangled particles near black holes. But the real meat of Hawking radiation is that due to other weird quantum effects of our universe, uh, black holes do not last forever. Um, thank you. I, uh, I do want to take a, a few minutes here at the end to just give you an opportunity to talk about some things you're working on, um, where people can find your stuff, like books, podcasts, um, all of that cool stuff. Yeah, yeah, thanks so much. Um, I, I, I'm busy and I like being busy. Uh, so you can always go to my website, pmsutter.com. That's P as in Paul, M as in Matthew, and then sutter.com. And that lists all the things I'm working on. Uh, some examples are my podcast, Ask a Spaceman, uh, my YouTube channel, uh, my weekly live radio show. So every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern, I go live to answer live questions exactly like this. Uh, over on YouTube, uh, you can find my books. One book is called Your Place in the Universe. The other is called How to Die in Space. Those are both available worldwide, uh, both online, audio Oh, excuse me. Audiobook, the whole deal. Uh, I also host a couple shows. Uh, I'm on TV on Science Channel's How the Universe Works. I'm also on Discovery Channel's Space Out show. Uh, I write articles for Discovery for Space.com for Live Science. I, I host these really crazy cool art and science collaborations. I, I just do all sorts of fun stuff, but PMSR.com is the place to go. Awesome. Thank you so much. Are, are there any um, last questions before uh, we allow uh, Paul to leave our event horizon here? <laughs> okay. In that case, I just want to uh, thank you all for being here. And thank you again so much, Paul, for taking the time to answer questions and, and uh, chat with us. That was great. Oh, thank you so much. This was tons of fun. All right, take care, we'll see you. Bye.